All right, so I'm here today with Benny Lewis, and we're going to talk a little bit about language projects and the Hungarian language. So before we get started, I wanted to tell you, Benny, a little bit about the project that I'm working on. So basically, in addition to working with Fluent in Three Months, I've also started working with Drops, which is a language learning app. And the founders of the company are from Hungary. And our first kind of team meeting is in Budapest in November. So I'm learning a little bit of Hungarian to surprise the founders of the company and some of my other co-workers. So I have about two months to learn Hungarian. And what I'm doing with this project is that I'm aiming for something really specific rather than aiming for fluency because I'm obviously not going to become fluent in Hungarian in two months. But what I can do is I can prepare for a certain situation. So that'll be kind of the day to day around our co-working space and engaging in some of those situations in Hungarian as opposed to in just English. And it's a casual work environment, so I'm not going to try and shift my entire work day into Hungarian. So it would be more small things like, oh, can I get you a cup of coffee, cream, sugar, as opposed to um, the click-through rate on this thing was much higher than we anticipated. So how could we recreate that in the future, you know? So it'll be a little bit more simple, but just to kind of show that, you know, I'm making an effort and that, you know, I'd like to talk to them on their terms and their language a little bit as well and not just have them only speak to me in English. And um, I'm also kind of limiting what I can do in preparing for this project. So I'm focusing almost entirely on vocabulary. So definitely more your Tarzan um, speak approach. And um, I'm also limiting which resources I can use. So obviously I'm mostly using drops in addition to a course book. So I'm really kind of seeing how creative I can get with my language learning pro uh, project with all of these different limitations. My questions for you are, you've obviously done lots of language challenge like challenges like this before, including one with Hungarian. Um, I've done the add one challenge, which is a three month project as opposed to like the two months that I have for this. But so I feel like the stakes are a little bit higher because in the add one challenge, you can kind of prepare for what you're getting into. Um, you can control that 15 minute conversation more than I feel I can control how my coworkers are going to respond to me. And I think that with a lot of your language miss missions, um, you kind of had that spontaneity as well when you got to your final video. So I'm curious to know what you did to prepare for that. So I actually only had two months with uh, leading up to my Hungarian video. Um, and in terms of preparation, I, I essentially thought, what are the things we're likely to talk about? And I first just wrote that out in English just to kind of brainstorm it as well as I could. And then I got help to translate both my uh, answers and the questions I would be asked so I could pick them up. And I think ultimately, like, it's just so hard to remember all that information. And it's why when you're focusing on the words, I would always try to see, is there some key word that I really want to try to say? I'm not gonna try and say this full sentence perfectly correct, because that's, that's just too difficult in the first few months. So I would I would still get it translated by someone because if you uh, if if you can like VI talking or something um, because if you do it yourself you may uh, cause more confusion when you're dealing with the Tarzan version of the language if you're using the wrong version of the translation so getting native help definitely makes a difference um, and I wouldn't be too intimidated by uh, Hungarian as far as grammar goes because it's really not that complicated a language. It's mostly the, um, like the only thing is the prepositions getting attached to the words at the end. Then it just kind of takes a little for your brain to work around that, but it's not as hard as people think. Although one thing I will say is you have to make sure when you're talking to Hungarians that you tell them that it's the hardest language in the world. Why is that? <laughs> it's because it's so fundamentally in, in my like, cells that I can't hear someone say this is the hardest language in the world without like saying no you don't have the context of other languages and you're not judging it on the right criteria but I found that in Hungary that was um, working against me because they they really take pride in especially how they like genuinely think it's the hardest language in the world and there are many reasons why it isn't but I um, I figured I probably should not have actually mentioned that to them. So like 
uh, all the time, even if they're complimenting you, just be constantly saying, oh yeah, but it's just such a hard language, you know? And, and this will like feed their egos and they'll just want to talk to you even more. So that's one important phrase to prepare. Let's talk about some other preparation. Um, as far as when you prepare for your final video, um, would you say that you over-prepared or how did you go about preparing for the unexpected? And, um, or maybe you like kind of played out how the scenarios would go in your head and prepared that way. What were some of the steps you took for that? I think when it comes to most of my final videos um, for, the, for my travels especially where I, would just grab somebody like in more recent years, I would have a teacher who I'd probably be working towards the final uh, video with, but the likes of the Hungarian video with Balint and my um, Egyptian Arabic videos, I just met people and came up with the idea at the last minute. And I think the reason, like the preparation was essentially the entire project. So all the time leading up to that was just me trying to be able to handle those kinds of situations. So while I could come up with a little bit of a script ahead of time, it's mostly just constant practice. And it's why um, if I was in your shoes, I would just get on italki as much as possible and, you know, speak with somebody on a regular basis. And it'll just get you over that like discomfort of, of unfamiliarity with the language. Um, but then specifically before the final video, it's more a case of maybe uh, one thing I would say is uh, not so much preparation for yourself, but for um, like if you do plan to make a like, are you planning to make a video or is it mostly for like uh, the interactions you'll actually have in the office with them? So we do plan on making a video when I initially surprise everyone, so it will be recorded. Okay, all right. So um, what I if you're going to be recording. I would absolutely learn as many phrases related to ignore the camera. Because um, I, I did this myself once with my Polish project that I just spent a couple of hours learning a little Polish. And then I met up with a friend I knew from Esperanto circles. And I just, I did not want to tell her ahead of time, I'm going to speak to you in Polish. So I said this to her and I said, just don't, don't pay attention to the camera. And um, and let's let's try to stick in in Polish, and and that's kind of another thing is their instinct might be to reply in English, uh, and say, oh wow, your Hungarian's very good. So you kind of have to, since you can't tell them ahead of time, you you have to kind of make it as automatic as possible to to imagine from their perspective. Like if you imagine so, uh, someone coming up to you with a camera, and and doing something like this. Um, and you could respond to them in a language you speak much better than they would speak your language. But if they say, oh, I, this is for an important video, can we please keep this in English? You would be like, oh, okay, whatever. So that's kind of uh, remembering that context would be very important to, to play it out. And if anything, I would even try to practice that kind of situation ahead of time. Like maybe not with that group, but maybe with somebody else, like maybe you'll bump into Balint, for instance, and you'll do the same thing. And you won't necessarily have to upload that video, but just the idea of, oh, ignore this, and I'm gonna try and speak Hungarian to you. Because what might happen is instead of it going perfectly smoothly, is he'll say, I don't, I don't understand, why, why are you doing this? And then he'll say, oh, if you said this, then I would have understood. So kind of, um, you know, really like a real life test of it because the phrase that comes most naturally to me or you, um, the first few seconds to get somebody in the mode that this is a video for showing this little project I've had, uh, especially like when you think of the cultural differences and so on, I think it's worth practicing that with one or two people before you arrive and then asking them, what do you think I should say at the start? And that'll just make the whole video go well, because otherwise it'll be a jagged start of them being like, oh, but we can just speak in English. And that's, that's kind of going to miss the point, you know? That's really good advice. Preparing for the scenario, like why I'm suddenly coming up to them and speaking to them in Hungarian when historically I've only spoken to them in English. So kind of, I guess, preparing that situation, like maybe, hey, I'm going to talk to you in Hungarian, so don't switch to English or something like that. And on top of that, I would like also put a time limit on it because something they might they, they might in their head be thinking 
but we have to work with her for several weeks. And that might not, not work in Hungarian if we're talking about all these complicated things. So I would also say, oh, can we speak just in Hungarian just for a couple of minutes? Then, then you'll kind of alleviate their concerns for the purposes of the initial interaction. Uh, you had mentioned earlier that Hungarian grammar isn't as complicated as we kind of like to think of it in our heads, but Hungarian is a pretty different language from any of the other languages that I've studied. It's in a new language family, so it's not going to have a lot of similarities as far as vocabulary and grammar to some of the other languages that I may have studied. So I'm curious to what your approach is to this, because both you and I have kind of studied languages from completely different families. Like you've studied Chinese and Japanese, as well as a lot of the European languages. So what do you do when you dip your toes into a new language family? One thing that's most interesting about Hungarian, it's definitely uh, like as different as you'll find other non-Indo-European languages in, in so many ways. But there is one thing about Hungarian that is uh, is essential that made it easier than Chinese, Japanese, and so on. And that is the culture around it. Because when I think back on my Chinese project, one of the hardest things for me was I, this, I, I kind of realized I relied a bit too much on going to social events, trying to make friends, maybe going to a bar and just talking to people randomly. And that wasn't really in the culture of, of China the same way it is in Europe. So in Hungary, the language is completely different, but the um, ability you have to interact with people is the same as you would have in so many other European countries. So this is why if you can potentially, before you leave, find a Hungarian group nearby, then I would try to practice with them. But then once you get past that, in terms of the language itself being completely different, um, I, like you said, the Tarzan use is, is extremely important. So I do try to have as much as I can to say all the things in just that language. And it's very difficult because the initial stages, if you're going from a similar language, you could piggyback off that. When I started learning Portuguese, I could just speak a lot of Spanish-like words, you know? Mm -hmm. But um, I think the hardest challenge is sticking 100% with that language. And it's why if you can, um, on the likes of like Skype calls and whatever, uh, just have the dictionary open and have pre-made phrases that are like tailored around the fact that you are having communication difficulties um, that prevents you from switching back to English. Because that's what's going to be uh, the biggest issue, I think, if you're jumping from one completely different language to another, is there's just so little you know how to say that the temptation to just say, oh, you know, in English, it's like this. And you want to get around that. You want to kind of force yourself through this awkwardness of, I only have like 10 words, I'm going to use the hell out of those 10 words. And then you have a dictionary at the side, so you can just Tarzan it up with, okay, this is the word for this, this is the word for this, and they kind of piece together themselves. And one reason I like doing this with italki teachers is because I feel a lot less embarrassment because I'm thinking I am paying this person to put up with my nonsense, <laughs> you know? I'm paying them to be patient. So they are going to sit there and they're going to wait two whole minutes until I can remember how to say the color blue because that's what they're paid for, you know? Whereas mm -hmm. obviously you don't want to put someone through that in um, in person as much. So it's it's something I would really kind of think of. I, I don't know if uh, there's a lot of good online dictionaries, but if you have any dictionary handy, just keep looking up the word. And um, if you absolutely have to type it in English in the chat, in the chat, but just get into this habit of not using the language because that for me is the hardest part when it's so different. Because I, I notice I don't really have that problem when it's a similar language. Because I, I just keep, in a way, in a way I'm kind of doing the same thing that people would when they're just switching back to English. Because I'm switching back to the other language and I'm just kind of putting a different accent on it. Mm. So yeah, that's what I would recommend is just get speaking as much as you can. And um, come up with as many mnemonics as you can, as quickly as you can. And then you'll see in the blog post I wrote that I also uh, suggested all of the um, cognates that we do have. 
and those are not necessarily linguistically uh, because of the, it's mostly because of the cultural overlap maybe some religious terms and so on so it's if you can get as many of them as possible then that's something you can at the drop of a hat you can remember these quick words you know and then from there you start to learn the ones that are as straightforward as possible and um especially because something like hungarian has the prepositions postpositions the, the sh like get attached to or sorry the prefixes and suffixes that get attached to the words you want to learn as many of them as quickly as possible because that, those are your building blocks to very quickly have a much more expansive vocabulary. When you were learning Hungarian, were there any particular challenges that you faced and what did you do to work through them? I think with Hungarian, I... Like, I did get a little hung up with the uh, the grammar as well myself because it's, it's something you just hear so much about. And I, I think that when I was most confident in the language was ironically maybe a week or two before the end of the project because I hadn't like moved myself on to the next stage of seeing all the things I didn't know yet that I was aware I was making the mistakes for. So um, it's tempting to like just look up all of these grammatical terms, but with the time limit that you have, I would intentionally like get, not get exposure to anything more complex than uh, the beginner stuff. So, you know, making the vowels match and putting the, the, the stuff at the end of the words, that's fine. But anything more complex than that, um, if you start to see the explanation, just be like, I'm not going to think about this too much. And that for me, that was a mistake because I, I thought, well, I've got this momentum, so I might as well try to learn this. But then I actually, ironically, was slightly worse um, for my final one or two weeks because I kept thinking in the moment, instead of just saying the words, saying it wrong and having the conversation move forward, I was thinking, okay, hold on. So this is referring to a person like that and it just, it messed everything up. And as far as how much study time I should be putting in since our language project time spans are about the same, what would you recommend? And then I'm just curious what sort of study time you put into your Hungarian project when you had those uh, two months. What I did as much as possible was to put not, not so much study time, but speaking time. So like, because I was in Budapest, it was easier for me to just go out, find people, socialize and try to use what I could. And there were lots of very patient people who were happy to do that with me. But in your case, I would try to have at least half of your time of actually speaking the language especially because it's it, it's not as bad as the likes of Chinese and Japanese that I think there's just there's a bigger barrier that holds people back from being able to get into initial conversations. But I think if you put half of your time at whether that be two hours, three hours, four hours a day, like I personally would put um, during my intensive projects, maybe two or three hours a day at just practicing speaking, and then getting, I would be kind of mentally noting or writing down quickly the problems I'm running into. And then two or three hours um, after that, either getting private lessons that are much more about me doing exercises or memorizing or just self-study. That's uh, it's about going through these processes. And, and it, it was always about fixing the problem I had while I was speaking. And that's kind of, especially with a project like yours that has a very specific end goal. Um, you have to remember most courses you'll come across will be tailor-made for people who plan to go like for a very long period of time. So they kind of do need to know all of the grammar pieces and so many vocab um, chunks, but you don't need that as much. So it's why you need to self-guide yourself a lot more because a lot of the traditional courses will give a lot of stuff that you don't need to know. As far as resources then in that case, I was actually a little bit surprised there weren't as many resources for Hungarian as I thought there might be. Um, so I'm curious, aside from your favorite resource, which is um, human beings, uh, what sort of resources would you recommend um, after this project? Since again, I am kind of trying to stay limited in what I'm using up until this two months, but after the two months, have you found any really helpful resources, especially perhaps for some of those grammatical aspects that you were mentioning earlier? So even during these two months, I, I would recommend you check out this, Asimil's Le Hongrois, um, just Hungarian for in, through French. 
and it's because they they actually did a very good job. I remembered using this same book. I like how it's explained, and、uh, they don't get into anything too complex. So definitely start with this.、Um, And then after that, I hadn't I hadn't gotten far enough to go on to any more deep courses, but I do believe there's a Hungarian Pod 101, and I think if I had access to that, then that would have helped a ton with my listening comprehension problems. And they're also very good for、uh, explaining grammar and vocab and stuff. So I would recommend Hungarian Pod 101. But otherwise, if you, if like people watching this would speak French, then definitely.、Um, The、uh, Le Anguar, but I did this way back in like 2010, I think. So it's very likely there have been resources that have come out since then that I wouldn't know of. Great, thank you. So before we wrap up, do you have any final tips for me for the day of the video,、um, aside from what you've already mentioned, as far as both the conversation itself and maybe even the technical aspects of filming? I would use some form of microphone like clipped to you. And record your audio separately, and that way you don't have to worry as much. Because as long as they're kind of close to you, you'll understand what they're saying. But definitely don't take the audio from a phone far away, because that'll mess things up. It won't be as as, as clear.、Um, and other than that,、uh, out of all the videos that I would have done, keep in mind as you're recording it that you can get a lot of footage. It doesn't have to be like a scene from Daredevil, one long take with no cuts ever. Like you can,、um, like have a very awkward moment, and that's that's possible. It's going to happen then, and it's very tempting to think, "Oh my God, whole project's ruined." If people watch the video, they're going to think I'm a moron. I've had those moments, and I just cut those moments out of the final video, you know, because I you want to get as much footage as, as much footage as possible, and at the end, like it'll feel like maybe I've had enough now, but I would just. Keep going until you're like completely、uh, done as much as you possibly can, and then just afterwards you can、uh, splice them together. Because、um, people kind of expect to see that anyway nowadays on on most uploaded videos, a little bit of cutting. So keep that in mind while you're doing it on the day that you can、um, you can like have an opportunity to try to explain something that you were saying again. If they say they don't understand, or if you try to talk to multiple people and one person is just Not interested at all, and just giving you a blank face. Just thinking the day on the day. That's okay because you have multiple minutes of footage that you can get.、Mm. Anything else that I may have missed that you think would be helpful? Yeah, like what one of the reasons I would say to practice ahead of time is not necessarily so you have a script you're following, because with, with、uh, my conversation with Balint, I practiced ahead of time, and in the end, we actually didn't use. The majority of what I had practiced, which was great, because then it made it actually a more genuine, spontaneous conversation. But all that practice gave me the confidence that I could deal with this conversation, I could get through it, and I think that that's kind of the biggest the, the biggest difference that you're practicing not necessarily because on the day those words will come up, but because you just need to be confident at at, at speaking it as as much as possible. And just remember that on the day, and like rewatch this on the day, and remind yourself that, you know, you might be thinking, oh, I, I should have studied more, or I'm nowhere near where I thought I would be, and that has happened to me every single time I've had every single project. I've never reached the end of my project and been like, do you know what? This went better than I thought it it would, and I know twice as much of the language than I imagined. It's it's I'm always feeling like I'm far behind. But that's okay because you're going to run into those issues, and the whole thing was just you're going to speak it. And even if you are doubting yourself, when you show the video to people online, they're going to be amazed at the progress that you've made, and the people you meet as well are going to be amazed at the progress you've made. So just always remember that that it's all relative, and don't be judging yourself too much on the day. Well, thank you.、Um... Do you want to take a moment to mention where everyone can find more about you and some of the language projects that you've done in the past? Yeah, people can just go to fluentintreemonths.com or look for Irish Podiglot on Instagram and、um, Twitter and Facebook, and just I'm always uploading stuff to all of these、uh, different channels. 
and um, I'm going to kick off my YouTube channel again very soon as well. So that's both Fluent in Three Months, the YouTube channel, and Benny Lewis, uh, my other YouTube channel. So that's it. Great. Thank you.